Good afternoon ladies, gents and Pikachus, welcome back to the show. Just a quick video today, I want to describe to you the beast from the sea. The evil one, you know, Satan and his minions, his main beast, as described in the Bible in Revelations. Now many people, when you say beast, you know, they think of a beast, they think of like a, an animal kind of thing that's going to be stalking and killing people. But I don't think that is what this is describing, although it is described anamorphically as an animal is described, it's a metaphor. The beast is not a physical animal. The beast is a human power, like a government or maybe a military or something like that. And I feel like if we read Revelations, if we go through the scripture, we can figure out the nature of the beast, we can recognize the beast because we need to know thine enemy, and then we can figure out what we're going to do about this beast when it does finally appear. So, to start with, the beast from the sea is described by many of the important prophets and um, the biblical saints from the past, including John the Baptist, Daniel, Isaiah, and also Job and Jeremiah. Genesis, Deuteronomy, and Proverbs in the Old Testament describe it in part, and Romans, John the Baptist, and Revelations describe it more thoroughly in the New Testament. That's what we're going to concentrate on today, the Revelations part of things. So I'm going to read you from Revelations 13. The beast resembles a leopard with the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. Satan gave the beast its power having a throne of great authority. So straight away we can tell that it's not going to be an animal. There is no animal that has a throne. There is no animal that Satan is going to give power to that resembles another animal. You know, if we were describing an actual beast as an animal, they wouldn't say the beast resembles a leopard with the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. The reason why this description is given is so that we can figure out from these animals the characteristics that this beast is going to have. And I think we can do that if we go through it. So to start with, why would it say the beast resembles a leopard? What's the characteristic of a leopard? Well, a leopard is a stealthy silent hunting predator that comes out at night and then recedes when it sees the daylight approaching. You know, when the sun goes down at the dusk, it comes out and it hunts through the night. When the sun comes up, it's scared of being seen, so it goes back into hiding. That's why the beast is resembling a leopard. We're being told there that in the evening time, in the darkness, that's when the beast is going to come out and do its evil. And when the sun comes up and shines the light on the world, the beast will escape or it will be killed. Either one of those things will happen. So that's why the beast from the sea that gets his power from Satan is being described here as resembling a leopard because it's coming out in the evening. That's when it's going to do its predating on the humanity, the us, you know, the human race. And we know from our reading of Zechariah 14, the evening described in Revelations in the biblical prophecy means now. Falling in the time between the end of the summer, which is July and August, and the beginning of the winter, which is October, November. So it's in two, three weeks time. That's the evening. We're in the evening now. After October, November, we're going to be in the night when the beast is going to be out. So we need to know before then what we're looking for. So it resembles a leopard, stealthy, slow hunting, um, silent hunter of prey coming out in the night and is going to be banished by the light. That's what we know from that. Next it says, the feet of a bear. Now, why would it say, if it's a leopard, the feet of a bear? What's special about a bear's feet? Well, a bear's feet are kind of like big human feet. A leopard is on its toes, you know? It kind of runs about quickly. That's why it's on its toes. It doesn't do a lot of moving. When it does move, it's running after something and expends its energy in the hunt, catches a prey, bites it, and then walks back with the body to the shadow where it's gonna eat its prey. Bears don't do that. Bears are slow moving because they've got these big feet that lay flat. And ecologically or uh, genetically, the reason they have these flat feet is to give them stability in the hunt. So they're not hunting, they're not running after things to do their hunt. They are ambush predators. They'll hang around behind a rock or behind a tree or something like that, or they'll just be moving around. And something will be near enough for them to grab and they'll wrestle with it and they'll bite it. That's how bears hunt. They don't chase things very far, although they can run fast, they don't like to. What they like to do is plant their feet, grab something and wrestle it and try and rip its arms off and bite it. 
It's what a bear does. So, going back to Revelations, the feet of a bear, they're flat, they have claws, and they are powerful. You know, they can grab things with their feet, like we can with our hands. And the reason they have these feet is for wrestling prey. Not for chasing them down. The prey comes to them, they ambush the prey, and they wrestle with the prey. And if we relate this back to an earlier part of Genesis, we know that when God appears as a man and wrestles with Jacob, that's something that God does. God does wrestle as a man with people, or in this case, a, um, you know, a beast. So the reason why I think the beast from the sea resembles a lion is because it's going to be stealthily stalking its prey in the dark, i.e. in the evening now. But it also needs to have the feet of a bear because it's going to have to withstand, at least for some time, God attacking it. And it knows it won't be able to run away. Even though it's got the characteristics of a leopard, it doesn't need to have the feet of a leopard because it knows there's no point running away from God. So the beast knows it's going to be destroyed, but it is quite happy to hang around and ambush us anyway. Thusly, we know the beast is not just intent on attacking humanity. There's purpose there. The purpose of the beast attacking humanity is to get at God because God cannot be harmed. So the beast is there to attack humanity in order to upset God. So we know the beast is of Satan because he hates God, but it is not Satan because it takes its power from Satan, as we're going to find out later. So it resembles a lion, uh, a leopard, sorry, feet of a bear. The next thing it says is it has the mouth of a lion. Now, everyone knows lions. You know, remember from the Lion King, the Disney? Lions are the king of beasts. So if you have the mouth of a lion, you have the authority to command all the other beasts. And when you roar, a lion's roar is absolutely flipping terrifying. It's the loudest thing you'll ever hear. It goes through you. It will stop you dead in your tracks. If you ever hear a lion roar and you're there to hear it, it will physically terrify you to hear a sound that loud and that deep and growly. So we know the reason why the beast from the sea has the mouth of a lion is because it is the king of beasts. It is the head beast. It is the high priest of Satan. And the roar is going to be terrifying. So people will respond to the beast's command. Thusly, it has the power and the authority given to it by Satan. The next thing after that is a direct thing. The beast will be the slave of Satan. It will have power given to him by Satan. So we know if it derives power from its master, Satan, even though it's a powerful beast, it is also a slave of Satan. And we are told in the Bible not to fight the slave to actually remonstrate against the master. So if the slave is the beast, but the master is Satan, then we are told we will not be the ones to defeat this beast. We will have to suffer the beast. The beast will be attacking us. Our job as Christians is not to take this beast on and probably get killed. So we should bow to its authority where we have to even though we're not going to like it, and we know its authority comes from Satan, so we're definitely not going to be happy with it. The reason we're doing that is to buy time so that the beast can be defeated, as we'll find out later, and then we will be facing the master, Satan. And with God's help, we will defeat that master. And then the last thing in Revelations 13.1 is, the beast has a throne of great authority. Many Others will bow in front of this throne as slaves of the slave, the beast, you know, the slave of Satan. So it's like a hierarchy. You've got Satan at the top, who we haven't met in this particular bit yet. Satan's giving his authority and power to this beast, making it in his image. So it's a horrible beast made out of all different animal parts with various terrifying attributes. And it sits on a throne of great authority. So we know it's not an animal. Even though it's got these animal attributes, we know it is a kingdom of some kind because it has a throne. But it has many others bowing as slaves and those slaves have kingdoms of their own, as we will find out. So I think we can tell at this point that the beast from the sea is the United Nations. That's what I think. Even though I'm having to figure this out with my work, this is not biblical now, this is me guessing. I think the United Nations is the beast from the sea. It does resemble a leopard. It's a stealthy, silent hunting predator. Nobody knows when the UN is going to strike and it uses politics and lawfare rather than an open attack. We've seen this in the current day. Look how it takes down its enemies. It collects all the other countries to attack them with politics, with media, with propaganda. 
claiming that it's peacekeeping the whole time. So it doesn't solve wars, it actually motivates wars, and it directs those wars through its seat of power, its authority given to it by Satan. So we carry on, we'll read further into Revelations, so we can get a little bit more detail on this. The beast did come out from the sea, and it had ten horns and seven heads. Each horn has ten crowns, and each bearing a blasphemous name. So, it arrives from the sea. Now we know the UN was created by charter following the maritime law of old. When everything was done naval ships, you know, everything was done with naval ships. That was how military power used to extend over the world. It was done via the sea on these big military ships. And that's where the maritime law came from. When maritime law fell out of favour and came to an end, it was replaced by the United Nations in the 1940s when we started to use air travel a bit more. You know, and communications started to become a thing. Before that, world communications weren't a thing. Leading up to the 1940s, phone lines were put between all the different countries and we started to have wireless communications although we didn't personally, these guys did. And so their authority could therefore be administrated without using the ships of the sea. And that is why we know it arrives from the sea, but it doesn't exist in the sea. And that's another thing about resembling a leopard. Leopards will hunt out of the water. They'll hide in the water, but they will not, they don't like to hunt in the water because they're at a disadvantage. So they come out the water to hunt and they go back in to hide. And that's like the UN. The UN, as we can see, well, you can't see the UN flag up there. I'll describe how the UN flag looks to you. I'll put a picture of it on the screen. The background is blue, azure blue, which is, by the way, a colour associated with Satanism. It is meant to represent the seas in a circular design. So they've put the earth into like a flat earth design, if you like. That's similar to how the flat earthers think the world looks. And it's divided into 4, 8, 12, 16, 32 segments, 32 seas, if you like. And upon the 32 seas are images of the various countries which are the member states. You know, that you've got five big blobs of land, and that's the five permanent member states, which is the United Kingdom, the United States, the Russian Federation, the Chinese Federation, and France. God knows how France got in there, but they're in there anyway. So that's your five permanent states, and then you get ten temporary states, which change every five years. So, if the beast from the sea arrives from the sea, which we know it does, hence the name beast from the sea, and the UN arrived from the sea because it was built from the um, pre-existing maritime law to carry that authority forward now that there's air travel and world communications... Then we can see that the UN has all these things. The UN does resemble a leopard. It hunts in the dark, in the night. It doesn't do things openly. It does indeed have the feet of a bear. It wrestles with other countries. It doesn't chase them around. They come to it in the UN Security Council Court and the International Court of Human Justice, which is controlled by them. It does indeed have the mouth of a lion. It's the king of the beasts. You know, all the crappy countries that we don't like seem to want to join the UN Security Council, including... All the ones who are pulling off this jihad, you know, that are against Israel. And it is the slave of Satan because it derives its power from its master, who is the master of the seas, Satan. Again, this is not all biblical stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm supposing this from my reading of Revelations and from other books. But this is what I think we're going to figure out in time is actually true. And the throne of great authority is the seat of the UN Security Council. We know they've got the big circular room with the microphone and the camera in the middle, and they all take turns to go up to the podium and say their little bit. They've all got the little, um, you know, the nameplate thing. And they have a big circular table, and only the permanent members get to make the laws. Everyone else is a servant. And when they are called, they have to appear, because they are servants or slaves of the seat of power, the throne of the beast. Then it says ten horns. Now, what can it mean by saying the beast of the sea has ten horns? Well, we know there are ten temporary members. So the ten horns are the ten temporary members, which at the moment, like I said, are generally people who support the jihad, which is a war against Israel and Christians, a war against the children of God and God himself. So the ten horns are the temporary members of the United Nations Security Council, who are at the moment anti-Jew and anti-Christian countries. And those ten horns appear on seven heads. Now, 
Going back to the UN Security Council, we know there are five permanent member countries, but those five permanent member countries are administrated by two human directors. So that's your seven heads. Five countries, two directors, and ten horns are the temporary, uh, the temporary member countries. So that's your ten heads and your seven horns. And then it says there are 100 crowns. So the ten heads have 100 crowns. That's what it says. And you think, hang on a minute. Why would you have 10 crowns on each head? That doesn't make any sense. But you've got to think metaphorically. Crowns doesn't need to mean a physical crown you have on your head. Where else would you find a crown? On a coin. Every single member state that uses currencies, which is all of them, have emboldened on their coins that they press for currency a crown. And underneath that crown is a symbol of a pagan idol, some kind of previous demon or god or a, uh, a king or something like that. And those crowns are the, um, you know, they're, they're the blasphemous icons, which we'll go into next. So we know, arise from the sea, maritime law, UN. Ten horns is the temporary members using the hundred crowns, again, from the UN. The seven heads is the five permanent members plus the two director humans. That's the seven heads of ten horns done. That's definitely the UN that I think it's describing there. And the 100 crowns bearing the blasphemous names is the currencies that they use because we know all in all over time there has been 193 member states and of those 193 member states 93 of those states use currencies with a christian cross on or a um, an image of jesus christ while he's alive you know not a dead christ like the vatican have so if we take those 93 states away we're left with 100 currencies with pagan idolatry on there and crowns on the back side. So we know that is the 100 crowns, the 100 currencies. And we also know these 100 crowns are currently in use by the 10, uh, the 10 temporary states. So all of this can tell us, if we decode it through our knowledge of scripture, revelations particularly, that the beast from the sea is very similar in both metaphor and reality with the currencies, the heads of the nations and, and the politics that they support, very similar to the UN Security Council. And then we go on to read the rest of Revelation. The beast was proud-mouthed and did utter many blasphemies to exercise its authority over its slaves, and it had authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth in blasphemy to slander God, his dwelling place, and those who dwelt in heaven. Now, the beast was proud-mouthed. We all know how much respect all these countries and the media and the government give to the UN. It's mentioned in films all the time. It was in, um, I think it's the Avengers movie, where the Hulk is talking to Iron Man and someone gets hold of a nuclear weapon. One of these terrorist groups gets a nuclear weapon and they're both looking at each other with incredul uh, you know, incredulous looks and they both say, but the UN outlawed those years ago. Like, you know, as if terrorists are going to care about that. So they're giving authority to the UN in that film, in the media. And that is the beast being proud-mouthed. It has its slaves telling us through media how powerful it is. It's not even there doing it. It has, you know, celebrities and Hollywood and governments and media by proxy, telling us how good this authority in the UN is when we have no record of it. We don't know that, trying to convince us through proud words that this is true. So we recognise the authority given by Satan to the beast. That's what that means. Then it goes on. And did utter many blasphemies to exercise its authority over its slaves. So we know that's what it's doing now. When it had this stupid non-binding vote the other day, two days ago, and um, like a 100 member countries of the UN, you know, previous and current and permanent, you know, none of the permanent ones did, but the temporary states all did. They all said, we want to get the Jews out of Israel. We want to have no Jews in Israel. We want to completely get rid of Israel. We want to re rename the whole thing um, as an Arab country, Palestine. And we want to let the Muslims have their caliphate over there. That's what these hundred states were saying, despite the fact that if that happened, most of these member countries would then be completely killed off by the caliphate. Like they clearly haven't read the Quran. They haven't got a clue what they're talking about. But they're doing that because they are slaves of the master. The master is the beast, and the beast himself is a slave of Satan. So we know the UN is driven by slavery by Satan. That is the reason why they speak so many blasphemies against God, and why the hundred crowns, i.e. the currencies of these countries, they were the hundred countries that voted for the Jews to be kicked out of Israel. 
Now we know, Israel is the dwelling place of God. We know that from reading the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant is held there. All the temples to God that have ever been built in biblical times were built there. Jerusalem is the seat of power of God. Everyone knows that. That's why the Muslims want to take it over. Because Allah's prophecy. So we know, 10 horns, 7 heads, 100 crowns, resembles a lion, feet of a bear, mouth of a lion, and the slave of Satan, has the throne of great authority. That's all true of the UN. Now we know the beast is proud mouth, uttering blasphemies against God to exercise that authority over its slaves, the hundred crowns. And then the last bit of that sentence is, this is going to be happening for 42 months. Now, how long do you think these temporary members will be in the UN Security Council for? I could tell you, it's four years. So how many years are in 42 months? 12 is one year, 24 is two years, 36 is three years, 42 months is four years. So we know exercising its authority over its slaves for 42 months also tallies with the temporary members of the Security Council at the UN. And we know that authority is coming from the throne of great authority, which the others are bowing to, which is the given authority of Satan through the beast. So we know again, we don't know, but I'm telling you, this is what I think. The beast of the Bible from the sea, described here in Revelation 13, is the United Nations Security Council. That is who we're going to watch when in three weeks' time the jihad openly starts and the news will be reporting it. The thing I said in my last video, you know, the Zechariah 14 reading. And that is why we're going to need to know this, because nobody realises when this happens, the UN is going to collapse on itself. And there will be war in the UN with those countries. So we'll have two wars then. In fact, three if you count Ukraine and Russia. We'll have Ukraine and Russia being at war, supported by China. We'll have Israel at war with the Arab states, supported by the um, European Union countries. And we'll have the United Nations at war with its own members. When the members who didn't have this Israel vote, i.e. the permanent members, United Kingdom... United States, China, Russia, and France. Well, China and Russia actually did support it, but the other three didn't. These countries are going to start infighting amongst, uh, amongst themselves. And then we're going to have a war in, in uh, Russia and, uh, you know, the edge of Eastern Europe. We're going to have a war in the Middle East with the Israelis and the Arabs. And the UN is going to be a war on the fringes of America, and that's going to bring in the United Kingdom. So we know this is describing... The world war that we went through the other day this is further evidence that the reading we went through of zechariah 14 is this happening now we know because it resembles a leopard they're going to be coming out in the evening to do the predating the hunting which is now we know that the throne of great authority is going to be speaking the slanderous words through the power given by the hundred crowns which is the united nations temporary members and that they are opponents of Israel and Christianity, and they actually are quite happy to support Islam to build their caliphate over the top of Jerusalem, despite the fact that that will mean, ultimately, that they will be wiped out as well. So we know they're not doing this in their own interest or power, they're doing it as slaves of the UN, who themselves are a slave of Satan. So, that's the end of the Revelations reading. I just want you to think about this. I know this might sound a bit far-fetched to some people, but if you think back to the creation of the UN and the reason why Israel was contested in the first place, because the Jews have always lived in Israel. The reason why people contest it, you know, the Arabs, is because they say, oh, Israel hasn't existed forever. It only existed since 1946. That's actually not true. What's existed since 1946 is the UN mandate for Palestine. That's how they defined the state of Israel. Israel was always there. We know this from our biblical reading. What happened in 1946 is the UN Security Council back then decided because of the British mandate that Israel needed to be protected that the people who were warring against Israel, i.e. current day Palestinians or the, you know, the recreation of Hamas today is a copy of the original um, terrorists of, of Hamas, the Palestinians from back then. Rather than going to war and just mopping them up back then in 1946, because we just had World War II, no one wanted to go back into war. Rather than nipping it in the bud then and solving the problem with further military action, 
the UN in its great wisdom and mercy decided no what we're going to do we're going to give the Palestinians a little bit of uh, land here right on the edge of their mortal enemies Israel who wanted to actually wipe them out and solve the problem then i.e. averting the war we're going to have now so that's probably what we should have done but we didn't or the UN didn't so they said Palestine you can have a little bit of land here which is actually technically Israel but we're going to take it off Israel and give it to you if Israel agree to this. And Israel said, we want peace, we'll agree. Here you go, you can have some land. Hoping that the Arabs would actually, in time, learn how to live peacefully and like have a, you know, a proper country and have schools and hospitals and proper politics and education. But this is not what happened. They didn't do any of that. They've stuck fast to their uh, slavery of Allah, you know, their teachings of the Quran. And they have been quite happy to brainwash and manipulate their own people train their little children to be soldiers and then cover them in ninja suits, give them guns and send them off up, uh, you know, to fight Israel. So Israel are shooting guys dressed up as soldiers with face coverings, running towards them with guns, AKs and, and grenades. And then when they pick out the bodies to bury them after the battle has ended, they realise a lot of these bodies are of young boys. They're 14, 13, 14, 15 year old boys. And that is not a very nice thing if you're a soldier. Like, I've never been a soldier, but I can imagine if you're a soldier and you're killing the enemy, when the team goes in to mop up the bodies, label them and uh, bury them, give them their last rites and such, because that's what we do. Civilised countries, we, we love our enemies in that way. After we've killed them, because they were trying to kill us, we don't drag their bodies behind horses. We don't set fire to them and cheer, you know, like the uh, Hamas Arabs do. We give them the respect that the dead is due and we bury them. But it's horrible when you realise, when you peel the mask back off these terrorists that you've just shot, and you realise that they're 13, 14, 15 year old boys. It's not a very nice thing to do. And thusly we know, even though the UN Security Council is using its false authority to try and convince everyone that Palestine is a legitimate state with a proper government, judge them by their behaviour. Not by what they say, or what other people say about them. The slander, the, the blasphemies that the, you know, the ten heads and the... And the the crowns have been saying judge them by what they do these guys are sending children disguised as professional soldiers into battle with faces covered holding machine guns and their orders are to go and kill as many Jews as they can so when they get killed surely the the Palestinians should be upset about this you know they should want to bury those people no they don't care what they want to do is make these bodies into a propaganda campaign and shout from the rooftops, Jews kill babies, Jews kill children. They don't take no responsibility for the fact that those children are dressed up as professional soldiers with machine guns with orders to kill people in a war that they started. And that's the reason why they're getting killed. Because they are a smaller number with worse equipment and virtually no tactics going up against a professionally trained, well-equipped army who are one of the best in the world. Israel's army are like one of the best in the world without a doubt. So why would you send your children dressed up as terrorists and face-covered soldiers with machine guns against these guys, knowing that they're going to get massacred? And they definitely will, because they're going to massacre you. If you don't kill them, they're going to kill you, and they're going to carry on, take hostages, rape them, and kill them, like we saw last year around this time in October. Why would you do that if you were a good, civilised, legitimate country with education, a good political system? Why would you do that? Well, the answer is you would not do that. Who do we know who takes pleasure in doing that kind of thing? Satan. How is Satan's authority administrated and recognised in revelations? Through the UN Security Council. Who is pushing for this agenda for war? The UN Security Council. So, in conclusion of this whole reading, the Bible bits and the bits I've added. In three weeks time when we see this global conflict really boil over and come to fruition, we're going to see in the media and the news, it's the Jews, it's this country, it's that country, it's this and that that's caused it, everything's going to be fake news. You and I can know. The real reason this is happening is because the seed was planted in 1946 by the UN Security Council, and the reason they have kept them and tried to make it look like they're nice, peaceful, they call themselves peacekeepers with the silly blue hats on, the reason they are doing that and did that then is because they know this is coming for them. God's kingdom is on the way. These prophecies will come true. We read in Zechariah 
Jesus himself will be stood on the Mount of Olives and he has said, these will happen. These will definitely happen. We went through the um, Zechariah, how we can liken that to the current day. We put the actual pin on the map to know exactly where this is going to happen and which direction the wall will be coming from. Wouldn't you just know it's exactly where Israel are being attacked today? The contested part of the lands in the Bible are exactly the lands which are contested today. And we can lead all of this back through our investigations of historical fact and the news to the actions of the UN Security Council in 1946. And we can see today, with that non-binding vote from two days ago, they are absolutely the same today. They are the enemies of God and the children of God being Israel and Christians. And it is their wish for the world to be at war so they can roar with their mouth of a lion and put their authority on everyone and make us all slaves so that we will willingly join the one world religion which is why the pope and now the orthodox patriarchs have been out spreading this propaganda that all the religions should join into one and that will be the way that the war ends you know because it's definitely religion that's causing this war it's definitely not psychotic maniacs dressed up as terrorists brainwashing their children using slaves of Uyghur uh, Muslims from China that are human trafficked in as wives to mass produce babies it's definitely not any of that that's causing the war it's religion it's God that's causing the war but the problem with that is if it's God causing the war then it isn't God because if God wanted to cause a war it would be over in like five minutes so as we read in Zechariah, as we just read in Revelations of what I personally believe to be the case, in summary of this whole video, when this war appears, the Lord is going to be patient. He's going to give these guys the time to express the fullness of what they feel. And it's not going to be very pleasant for us, but we're going to get through it. And at the end, they're going to see nothing but defeat. God is going to crush the forces of Satan and Satan himself. And we just need to do our jobs as Christians and make sure we arrive at that point without having done anything stupid, without having contributed to the absolute hell that these guys want to bring, the UN Security Council, temporary members under the authority of Satan, and recognize that the beast from the sea is the UN Security Council. And do not listen to a word they say because they'll be lying every single day in the media trying to blame this on this, that and the other, Jews, Christians, whatever. This war is caused by the slaves of Satan who are Islam, followers of the Pope and the Orthodox Patriarchs who defended his actions and words the other day, and the UN Security Council, and Christians are their enemy. So, I hope I made that clear, and you enjoyed that and you learnt from me. God bless you all, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye now. So, there you are. But don't take my word for it, like I always say. Don't listen to me, listen to your own intuition. Read the Bible, look online, talk to people, discern the truth for yourself. Don't follow false prophets. So that's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed that. God bless you all, and I'll see you lovely people in the next one. Bye.